today we're going to talk about Edmonia Lewis, who actually has two names. And you may wonder how she happened to get two names. Well, to uh, start uh, telling about her, I'll have her tell about herself in an interview they had with her about her early life. My mother was a wild Indian and was born in Albany of copper color with straight black hair. There she made and sold moccasins. This is not her mother, this is Edmonia. Um, my father, who was a Negro and a gentleman's servant, saw her and married her. I was born in Green High in Ohio in 1843. Mother often left her home and wandered with her people, whose habits she could not forget. And thus we, her children, were brought up in the same wild manner. Until I was 12 years old, I led a wandering life, fishing and swimming and making moccasins. Well, Wildfire was the Chippewa name that was given her by her Native American mother. <clears throat> that name seems to set a stage for her very fearless and independent life. Actually, Wildfire did choose a more familiar sounding name, Edmonia Lewis, when she went to Oberlin College in 1859. Edmonia Lewis is the name by which she became known as the first sculptor with a Native American mother and African American father. Though even in later years, she was sometimes called wildfire and in a way it suited her independent spirit. With that introduction, I will try to fill in with some details of her education and her remarkable career as a sculptor in the United States and in Rome. I became acquainted with Edmonia Lewis when I made a report on women artists several years ago. And I became even more interested in her when I found out that she went to Oberlin College and was there a few years later after my own great-grandmother was a student at Oberlin. So I felt connection with her right away. <laughs> Edmonia Lewis had a brother Samuel who was 10 years older. He became a successful gold miner in California. And after their parents died, he financed some schooling in New York State for Edmonia or Wildfire, and then encouraged her to go to Oberlin College in Ohio, where she studied from 1859 to 1863. Oberlin was co-educational from its start in 1835, and had begun admitting African Americans soon after, which was early time for African Americans to have an opportunity to go to college. And when Edmonia was at Oberlin, there were about 30 other black students there. In my research, I was shocked to learn that while Edmonia was a student at Oberlin, she was accused of poisoning two white female students. Wow. They, re they recovered, but she was seized and beaten so badly that she was bedridden for three months. Eventually, she was acquitted, but soon left Oberlin College without graduating. In order to find out more about her, I contacted Oberlin College librarian and received copies of an article in the Oberlin Alumni Magazine. Supposedly, she poisoned some wine. So this is quite a, quite a picture that, was, that went with the article. 
and I found out um, a lot more of the details. Um, the whole situation was complicated by racial tensions in the town following an influx of many free blacks now living in town, plus increasing numbers of black students at the college. A rowdy bunch of white town youth were responsible for the vicious beating of Antonia following the poisoning accusation. Although town and college leaders tried to calm things down, news stories traveled across the country. After the highly publicized trial and acquittal, Edmonia was carried out of the room on the shoulders of supportive students, both white and black. Even though acquitted, however, the, ex the experience must have been distressing to her and she left college without graduating. While a student at Oberlin, Edmonia may have taken some art courses, and that's where perhaps her interest in art developed. In any case, after she dropped out of o Oberlin in 1863, her brother helped her financially to study in Boston as a sculptor and to open a studio of her own. In the Boston directories of 1864 and 65, she was actually listed as a sculptor. This was very unusual because women were not supposed to be able to be sculptors. And um, in sp also, she was Native American and Black American, so she had triple prejudice against her, yet she, she pushed on, she wanted to do it. While in Boston, Edmonia became acquainted with several influential uh, abol abolitionists, including William Lord Garrison and Frederick Douglass, who helped further her career. Her clay medallion, small, like that, it, of the abolitionist John Brown was an early success. She made many copies of it in plaster and sold them at abolitionist and church meetings. Then in 19, 18, excuse me, 1864, she had another financial success, modeling a head of Robert Gold, Gold Shaw who was the white leader of an all-black regiment in the Civil War. And uh, if you remember your history, most of the soldiers died, and so did he. But uh, she made 100 plaster copies of that sculpture. This was a large one. and. With additional help of, with her brother, she was able to work and study in Rome. At the time, Rome was an international uh, place for, for artists, poets, uh, writers, and also it was affordable. Living costs were low. Carrara mar marble was available in abundance, and ammonia became uh, Ed Monia, Ed Monia uh, became part of a group of women artists who, some of whom were sculptors, and they kept encouraging each other. They followed the neoclassical style, as you can see here, which was very popular at the time. And Monia studied the original marble classical statues of Rome and Greece and copying them to perfect her skills, which is what people did in those days. The procedure was first to make a, mar uh, make a clay model, assembling armature to hold it all together. Uh, then 
a marble copy was cut, copying the original clay. Uh, sometimes she hired stone cutters to help with the marble stage, and Edmonia soon became very skilled at this. She was a very persevering artist, as, as you can see. Wealthy Americans, patrons of the arts, visited her studio in Rome and became a good source of buyers. The fact that Edmonio was a combination of African and Native American seemed to attract many to her studio. Her only anxiety was that they might buy her works because of her racial background rather than because of their quality. Interesting thought. As you will see when I show the photos of her sculpture on my charts, she did a variety of subjects. Bus, conceits, I'll tell you what that means later, and then various themes over there, the uh, Native American, uh, African American, uh, biblical and historical. <coughs> Um, subject matter varied according to her interests or those of the people who commissioned her work. For more income, she often made cast and plaster copies of her originals. In the late 1860s and the next decade, Edmonia Lewis produced and sold more than 24 outstanding statues and receive people from all over the world in her studio in Rome. And Monia apparently loved Rome and its opportunities for artists. She also felt more comfortable away from American racial prejudices. Even when the demand for neoclassical work declined in the 1880s, and many other artists returned to America. Edmonia continued to live in Rome with occasional trips to the United States for exhibitions or commissions. Her last recorded commission was for a church in Baltimore, an altarpiece combining Asian, Caucasian, and African-American cherubs. This was in 1883, and she would have been about 40 at the time. After this, little is known about Edmonia Lewis, still sometimes called wildfire. It is believed that except for the occasional trips to America, she lived in Rome for the rest of her life. Even the date of her death is unknown. Though many of her works are now lost, a number of museums in the United States and abroad are fortunate to have samples of her work. Her successes, in spite of barriers of race and gender, has been of special in inspiration to minority artists for over 130 years. Now I'll show you some of the sculpture of Edmonia Lewis. The first group are the busts. Uh, here are some samples. Number one, Anne Quincy Waterston, 1865. She was a friend of Edmonia, and this beautiful likeness of her was one of the first sculptures that she did in marble in Italy. Anna and her husband had helped Edmonia raise money for the initial purchases of marble in Rome. Number two, young Octavius, 1873. The popular style in Rome at the time was neoclassical. Like other artists, Edmonia Lewis copied classical sculptures as a way of improving her skills. This one is young Octavius, considered 
by many as one of the best copies of this made at the time. Must have been a lot of work doing these. When you think of doing it in clay first and then the marble. Three is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. This one is in the Liverpool Museum in England. There is a similar one of him at Harvard, which you might have seen sometime. Edmonia felt a special connection to Longfellow because of his being the author of Hiawatha. She felt that he really appreciated the Native American culture. Four, Abraham Lincoln. We've been hearing a lot about him recently. Uh, this is another of the famous busts of famous people that she did, including Ulysses Grant, John Brown, Horace Greeley, and Senator Charles Sumner. If it was a, of a famous person, often plaster copies would be made so she could sell them. San Jose Library has a copy of Abraham Lincoln. Edmonia was also commissioned by non-famous people because marble sculptures, marble busts, were very popular <coughs> in those days. Now I'll move to conceits. I don't know if any of you know what conceit means in relation to art. I didn't, and I wondered what it was and was pleased to find out, though it wasn't in the dictionary. They're small, fancy pieces of art usually of a playful nature. So that would be like Cupid's. So th those are conceits. Mm -hmm. um, the one on the top, number five, is Puck. Uh, and she, uh, which it's about 30 inches tall. Don't, that doesn't seem very small, but I guess for sculpture it is. The next two, Six and seven, six is asleep, and seven is awake. Uh, she exhibited both of these on one of her trips to America in San Jose, California. More than 1,600 people came to see her work. Can you imagine 1,600? I can't imagine even counting that many, but that's what they said it was. And friends of the library there in San Jose purchased Asleep and Awake, as well as Abraham Lincoln, for the library after the exhibit. So if you go to San Jose Library now, you will see those three on pedestals in the lobby. Now, moving over to the, the themes. The first one, Native American number eight, old arrow maker and daughter, 1872. This sculpture of old arrow maker and her daughter is one of her works that shows Edmonia's reverence for her Native American traditions and her wish to share them with others. The maiden is thought to be modeled after her earlier sculptures of Minnehaha from Hiawatha, though her face is quite neoclassical. In her sculptures, she tried to depict Native Americans as peaceful, counteracting the general view of them as murderous. Boston Friends bought this and gave it to the Boston YMCA. In my, in my book about Edmonia Lewis, which came through the interlibrary loan, I found on one page um, parts of the poem Hiawatha. And Robin Sylvester read things aloud, so I persuaded him to read part of it. You probably remember Hiawatha and memorizing it in eighth grade or seventh grade. Okay. 
At the doorway of his wigwam sat the ancient arrow maker in the land of the Dakotas, making arrowheads of jasper, arrowheads of Chaldenoni. At his side, in all her beauty, sat the lovely Minnehaha, sat his daughter, laughing water, plating mats of flags and rushes. Of the past, the old man's thoughts were, and the maidens of the future. Through their thoughts, they heard a footstep, heard a rustling in the branches, and with glowing cheek and forehead, with the deer upon his shoulders, suddenly from out the woodlands, Hiawatha stood before them. At the feet of laughing water, Hiawatha laid his burden through the red deer from his shoulders. And the maiden looked up at him, looked up from her mat of rushes, said with gentle look and accent, you are welcome, Hiawatha. Thank you. I'll have to go home and read the whole Hiawatha. <laughs> it was really a favorite of ours in those days. Still is in the corner one by mine. The next one that I'd like to point out is an African-American theme. Number nine, Forever Free, 1867, which is in Howard University. Forever Free expresses the emotional feelings of African-American slaves following the Emancipation Proclamation. It is perhaps the first statue of an African-American family the kneeling woman represents gratitude, and the man's uplifted arm and broken manacles show triumph. As old arrow maker and daughter showed pride in Edmonia Lewis's Native American heritage, so forever free and daughter showed pride in her Native American heritage her African-American heritage. These are themes in several other sculptures of hers also. It is significant that while other neoclassical sculptures usually chose classical literature and history for their subjects, Edmonia Lewis included also issues of slavery and racial oppression. Now move on to, there are a couple of biblical ones there. Number 10 is Hagar in the wilderness. Biblical themes were also popular at the time. Edmonia used the biblical theme of Hagar in the wilderness. If you remember your Bible, Hagar was the bound servant of Abraham's wife, Sarah. And after previously barren Sarah bore her husband a son, Hagar was sent out into the wilderness to escape Sarah's jealousy. Edmonia has sympathy for all women who have been cast out and left to wander in the wilderness. Today, this is considered to be one of her more important works. It is now in the Smithsonian National Museum of Art, American Art. Uh, Moses is one of the ones she copied from Michelangelo. She did this in 1875. This was not considered as good a copy as her young Octavius was. But I'm sure she learned something from it. Uh, the last picture I want to show you is number 12. It's historical. Um, the death of Cleopatra. 
This was considered by many to be Edmonia's masterpiece. When Cleopatra realized that her empire was lost and mistakenly believed that Antony was dead, she made plans to kill herself with a bite of an asp, which I found out was a snake. Maybe you already knew that. Um, Edmonia showed the pain of death in Cleopatra's face and in her whole body. This led to controversy about its suitability as most people at the time expected statues not to show any sign of pain or suffering. They expected serenity. Now, even though it was a huge sculpture, 63 inches tall and 3,000 pounds, Edmonia had it crated and transported from Rome to the United States in 1876 for the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Now, some of the, of the art items were not accepted, so she was a little nervous when she brought in this 3,000 pound sculpture, but she was delighted that it was accepted and placed in the main hall, where it drew thousands of visitors and also many good reviews in the newspapers. One paper noted, the qualities of the work could only have been produced by a sculpture of genuine endowments. Um, the Oberlin Review, remember where she went to college, called her a renowned sculptor, which must have been some satisfaction to Edmonia Lewis. In spite of all this excitement and publicity, Cleopatra was not sold, but put in storage and apparently lost for years. It turned up a hundred years later, first in a Chicago saloon, then as a grave marker for a horse named Cleopatra. <laughs> Finally, it was rescued from a salvage yard in 1995. Then it was restored to all its glory and displayed in a place of honor at the Smithsonian. During her career, the works of Edmonia Lewis were well received in the art world and in the big exhibitions and world fairs. I, she uh, showed them in many exhibits and I have a poster there under 10 and 11 that I'm going to read you some from. Um, it possibly was for an exhibit in Boston, but it only says it was at uh, Pine Street, so I don't know for sure. The beautiful creations of this young artist are real merit and have received the enconiums, encomiums of professors and connoisseurs of art in Europe and America, and cannot but fill our hearts with pride as a contradiction of the assertion that we have never produced an artist of true genius. Those who fail to see these works will miss an opportunity which may never occur again. The bare announcement of the artist's name should be sufficient inducement to fill the house with our people every night. Unfortunately, the case of Cleopatra is similar to that of others of Edmonia's works, which were later discredited and lost over the years after her death. I find it hard to understand sometimes why artists are forgotten after they die. This seems to happen to some of them that uh, they're forgotten and then they're discovered maybe a hundred or two hundred, three year, 300 years later. In Edmonia Lewis's case, part of the reason was that neoclassical sculpture went out of style. But also there remained racial prejudice toward all artists of black heritage at that time. I also thought that 
she was a good advertiser of her work. She promoted it well. At one of the exhibits, she set up a wigwam there to attract people to her area. Um, fortunately, in recent years, her sculptures have been found in basements and other places and treasured by universities such as Harvard, Howard, and Oberlin and are now in museums in San Jose, Baltimore, Detroit, and Newark, at the Smithsonian National Museum of American Art, they fill a whole room. Um, so that's, that's really quite special, and so if you're going to Washington, do visit, do visit there. And I wondered whether they might have put one of her Native American um, sculptures uh, in the, the new Native American museum there. Certainly suitable. So check it out. Well, thank you for coming. And I'm wondering if we could somehow get a picture of the whole class now that we have a movie camera going here. You think this could be done, Robbins, one way or another? Could could you all stand and uh, maybe move up toward the front and look toward Robbins? Please don't be bashful. <laughs> I'm Meg Barstow. I'm Myra Miner. I am Howard Miner. <laughs> I'm Theo Fitzgerald. I'm Doris Ellis. I'm Jenny Vincenzo. And I'm Cindy Brown. I'm Doris Preferi. And I'm Bill Vincenzo. And I'm Doris Tomlinson. <clears throat> and I'm Peg Wallace. I'm Judy Tatters. I'm Other Eye. I'm Janet Hansen. Janice McKesson. I'm Bob Hans. I'm Lola Hans. No. Why don't you come in here, Relics? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shall I sit up here? I have the honor and privilege of being <laughs> Meg's husband. <laughs> I think we all ought to give a cheer and say, uh, what do we say about uh, long live art, all together. Long live art! <laughs> and great job, Meg.